Everybody get a good lunch? All right. Show of hands, how many educators in the room? How many people from the tech side? Cool. Any entrepreneurs? Any military, government? Awesome, awesome. OK, welcome, welcome. Um, I'm excited to be here today. Let me just jump right into my presentation, if I may. Uh, my topic is what advances in brain science coupled with AI can bring to learning at scale. So I believe that education has a last mile problem, and I'll explain to you what I mean. I think that predominantly education has focused on content and classrooms, and this hasn't changed since Socrates started teaching under trees 2,500 years ago. Now, of course, computers have done remarkable things for education, but they've also introduced some challenges. How many of you are familiar with PICN? PICN, a couple people. PICN stands for Presentation Induced Cerebral Necrosis, often known as death by PowerPoint. And I bring this up because there are organizations out there, you may know some of these organizations, that believe that by rendering something into PowerPoint, it takes on some magical property to communicate knowledge and to transfer knowledge and understanding. We know this just isn't true. So education has traditionally focused on the what, which is the content, where learning happens, often classrooms, but how has been largely ignored, ignored, excuse me. And I think the how is the last mile to the brain of the learners, and this is very key. So our challenge at Cerego is to see whether we can radically improve how we learn at scale. That's our mission. I'm Andrew Smith-Lewis, co-founder and CEO, and our mission is to improve how the world learns by building a single generalizable platform for acquiring and demonstrating knowledge and capability. Bit of a mouthful. Generalizable means one platform, one platform in the cloud, the AWS cloud, with infinite possibilities. Astronomy, aviation, music, medicine, zombies, whatever the content is, it's on one platform. And we're very big on helping people not only get stuff into their head, but be able to demonstrate their knowledge and their underlying cognitive and behavioral attributes, things like diligence and agility that we'll talk about in a minute. Essentially, what we want to do is we want to make people smarter. How many people would like to be smarter? OK, right? Me too. That would be a good thing to be. So we have applied this technology across a bunch of sectors, K-12, higher ed, corporate, and government. On the K-12 side, we work with traditional publishers, such as McGraw-Hill. We work with the very fine KIPP charter schools. We work with GEMS. Um, GEMS Education is a phenomenal group out of Dubai that has about a quarter of a million K-12 learners. In higher ed, we work with everyone from ASU to NYU to places like Africa Leadership University, Cengage, Elsevier on the health science side. Corporate, we power uh, Target for retail operations training, companies like Salient and Financial Services, and Garden Health, which is doing liquid biopsies, which is really remarkable. And lastly, on the government side, we work with the US Army, um, primarily around life saving. We run a program with the US Army for tactical combat casualty care, which is sort of first aid for combatants. It's a really interesting program. Um, in fact, we work with a whole slew of really interesting companies. We've worked with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. We've worked with the Smithsonian. We've done things with Japanese companies. We have about 500 partners around the world. We had about 5 million users on our platform. So I want to talk to you about our secret sauce, which is AI infused with brain science. And for us, what we use this for is to measure knowledge and capability to predict performance, which is really key for learning, and to accelerate learning. And let me give you a little bit of a flavor of what I mean by brain science and what that's all about. So for us, we have a machine learning tune system, and this is a learning algorithm. How many of you are familiar with DARPA? OK. Our DARPA stands for the Distributed Adaptive Retrieval Practice Algorithm. So this is our unique DARPA, a little smaller than the big DARPA for now. Um, and this takes advantage of two of the most readily provable phenomena for learning. One is distributed learning, which says if long-term retention is your goal, spread the information out over time. Intuitively, we know this, right? And the other is retrieval practice, which says when you re-engage with content, you do it in such a way that you stimulate the brain of the learner. So you get some long-term potentiation, some memory form. There's some desirable difficulty there. Both of these things are highly provable, very well researched, and completely counterintuitive to what students like to do, right? So students like, do not like to do distributed learning. What do they like to do? Cram, exactly, which none of you in this room have ever done, but it's an age-old practice for basically 
partying an entire semester, staying up the night before and attempting to pass an exam, only to forget everything the next day. It's not a very effective strategy for long-term learning. And the opposite of retrieval practice is, is rereading. And we all do this, right? We love to reread stuff, because when you read something, you have the feeling of knowing it. But then two hours later, you can't remember you read it, right? So these things are counterintuitive, but highly effective. The algorithm, the machine learning algorithm that we've developed can measure what you know, what you don't know, and create an optimal schedule for you to basically build and maintain knowledge. And that's basically the way our algorithm rolls. The other idea is about reducing um, the metacognitive burden for users. So when someone sits down to learn, part of their cognitive workload is focused on the task at hand, but a lot of their brain is taken up by the housekeeping of what should they be studying now? Where are they strong? Where are they weak? When do they go forward? When do they go back? What's for lunch? When are they getting deployed? And that stuff takes, bless you, that stuff takes away from the task at hand, which is learning the material. So with Serigo, we just have a better mousetrap. When you come into Serigo, we know you, and we tell you exactly what you need to do, and we get you in and out as fast as possible. This increases engagement, and it motivates users, and this is super key for the system. It's like having a personal tutor that knows you better than anyone else. On the actionable insights, and this is one of the things I want to talk to you a little bit more about today, um, basically we're into this idea of, of quantifying knowledge. You know, how many of you have a Fitbit or an Apple Watch on? All right, like a lot of us, right? And these things are awesome for kind of measuring and quantifying our mu movement through physical space and time. But what if you could do that from the neck up? What if you could actually measure what you know and predict your future performance and always be able to go back to it? That's our vision. So what we're trying to do is basically quantify what's coming into your head. Make sense? So we have this data-driven model for insights that basically surfaces not only what they know, but how they learn. And this how is super critical. It's also an evidence-based platform. So we do a lot of efficacy studies and research. We're in some longitudinal study with SRI that um, is working with us on our grant from the Bill and Linda Gates Foundation. We've contributed research with uh, the University of Toronto. NYU does a lot of work with Serigo. PEO Stry is a government organization uh, for the Army that's testing out Serigo. And I'll tell you a little bit about results. So NYU Dental School uh, basically approached Serigo three years ago. Their faculty created all of their own content on our platform. We're not an education company. We don't provide content. So they create their own content in our system. And they rolled it out to their students. And in the last couple of years, they've seen a 99.8% pass rate on the dental board exams. NYU is a very fine school. They're usually about 80%. 99.8 is a big jump. In fact, it's 2.6 standard deviations greater than all the other 71 North American dental schools. That's really good results. They've also seen a 50% reduction in instructor time because they're able to offload a lot of the foundational learning to the system, which is just going to do a better job of knowing your learners than you are for 30 individuals. And the instructor who, uh, who runs this program says it's easier than PowerPoint, which I, I guess is a really good thing, and obviously they've gotten very good results. Uh, we support some really interesting projects. Last year, we contributed the platform uh, to something called Project Hope. They were looking at Syrian refugee children in Turkey who were looking to assimilate into Turkey. So they were teaching them Turkish on our platform, seven to nine-year-olds, about 150 students. They got some great results, not only in terms of the benefits for learning, but increasing the sense of hopelessness by giving these children agency to learn something that's going to be important for their lives and their family lives. And that's a peer-reviewed paper that you can look up that was published in January. All right, so what do we offer? So the Serigo stack that runs in the cloud is a full stack learning solution. There's an authoring environment. There's delivery and integration, learning and analytics. Let me walk you through a little bit about what this stuff is. Authoring means basically creating content. We have a wonderful template. What you're seeing there is a bunch of different colors that represent different types of knowledge. And instructors or instructional designers basically use that palette to create their content within our system. We also use some natural language processing and neural networks to accelerate that process, to basically boost the productivity of an instructor. And so what we've done is we've created a model in the cloud, AWS Cloud, of course, 
that basically is trained by reading 5.5 million articles on Wikipedia, 3.4 billion words. We've created a knowledge graph of that content that we use to extract concepts. And basically, every time somebody uses it, the system gets smarter. A rising tide floats all boats. And the more people that play with the model, the smarter it gets. And we use it to generate the learning items. So as an instructor, you can basically we trained it on Wikipedia, but you can upload a PDF of your instructional material. The system can take a first pass at creating that content that creates a very strong straw man of materials that you'll then use to create your final uh, output. Delivery and integration. So we have, obviously, course management. Sergo is not an LMS, but it's, it's been called the LMS of the future. I don't know if that's a good thing. I think LMSs should just kind of disappear a little bit. But basically, what we're trying to do is take care of all the housekeeping you need to run courses, et cetera. And we've done that through LTI and interoperability, plugging into any system of record, Canvas, Moodle, Blackboard, Sakai, uh, edX, open edX, can all be powered by the Serigo system, which is cool. Learning, my favorite part. I mean, we make learning apps for mobile, iOS and Android native app applications, as well as, obviously, web. The native applications can run offline. We've got UNICEF as a client in Nigeria that uses us uh, in offline mode so that their trainers can be out in the field with devices, and then they touch the mothership once in a while to upload their data. Mobile is amazing. The only thing that we found twice as effective as Serigo is Serigo on a mobile device. We've seen that our users who touch the system as little as 25% of the time get a 2x return on mobile which kind of makes sense when you think about it, right? Because we look at our mobile phones 75 times a day. And if there's a little thing saying, hey, jump back into your history course, you're more likely to comply. Little and often is the magic recipe for driving uh, knowledge and retention. And so mobile is ideal for that. On the analytics side, we make great dashboards for instructors that give them all sorts of information, not just on, hey, some student got a 90 on a test, but predictions about future performance, understanding about what they know right now which is kind of cool. And of course, we do that on mobile as well. So imagine being an instructor, pulling out a mobile phone, and you get the bullet right there, how many of your students are on track, off track, your top students. And then you get some um, intervention on content. Here it says, hey, your students are suffering through the Ashman Welsh t-tests. That would be a good thing to review in class. So you can just pull out your phone and get some targeted interventions. Let me take a sip of water. The whole thing runs in AWS, of course, and that's why we're all here. And we also run an AWS GovCloud for our government clients who require a certain level of security and protection. So we run two instances there, and we have a whole slew of services that we're using, everything from EC2 to Amazon CloudWatch. I'm not going to read them off for you, but you get the idea. OK, so two things I wanted to announce today on stage that are very relevant to uh, the work we're doing. One is called Serigo Insights. And Serigo Insights is moving beyond just tracking retention, what people know, but developing a, sort of this holistic view that really gives insight into true learning capabilities. We have a diligence metric that basically tells you about dedication, grit, and resilience, a knowledge metric that shows you depth of expertise, a little bit different from current performance, and lastly, agility, which shows you how fast people are to acquire knowledge and slow they are to forget. Um, I have some quick screenshots here. Here's one uh, high level that's showing an organization the most efficient time for their learners to be on the system, which is kind of cool to know. In this case, 9 a.m. to 12 p.m., these are early morning people. They're most efficient there. On the right, we can see that they study every day of the week, and they study very little on the weekend, but actually Sunday is a highly efficient day for them. Kind of interesting. Um, then we can look at one particular snapshot here. This is agility. This is basically fast to learn and slow to forget. This is my team. Um, you can see that the fastest person on my team is actually a dog, which is, you know, rather interesting. Um, I think there's a human behind that. Okay. And now, what's really cool is powering the thing by voice. So what we are announcing today is our first application for Alexa, um, which is a skill that is designed to do what an instructor might want to do, but using voice. I'm going to try to demo this for you. I bought brought my Alexa show. You want to all huddle around, and that's not going to work, right? Um, I'm going to try this. It's a live demo. You know, We'll see what happens. Um, the stuff on screen is less relevant, but it's giving some cues and prompts for the, uh, the instructor. Let me see if I can get this to work for us. I'm going to take off this mic and hope this doesn't explode on us in sound. Alexa, start Sarago. 
Okay, Andrew, I've successfully connected to your Serago account. How's my astronomy course doing? Your AST 111 has 90 students on track and 10 who are falling behind. Would you like me to nudge those 10? That's a good idea. Okay, I've sent push notifications to those students who are off track. When do my students study? Your students are most active on Friday mornings, between 9 a.m. and noon. When should my students study? Individual times vary, but overall your students are more efficient in the evening between 9 p.m. and midnight. <laughs> Is there anything I should cover in class tomorrow? Some students are struggling with the concept of galaxy clusters and superclusters. You may want to cover these items in person. Can you remind me about superclusters? From your content. A supercluster is a large group of smaller galaxy clusters or galaxy groups. It is among the largest known structures of the cosmos. Now imagine you're uh, in a corporate environment um, and you're looking to find out stuff about diligence and motivation for your learners. Could be academic as well. That was an example of me as an instructor at Arizona State University for one of the courses we power, AST 111. So let's look at a corporate example really fast. Alexa, I need three experts on learning science. Take a look at Andrew, Ian, and Kyle. They have the deepest knowledge of learning science within your organization. Find three detail-oriented people from my team. Julia, Jake, and Ellison have the highest diligence across your team. What's the difference between knowledge and diligence? Knowledge refers to the depth and retention of a particular subject area, while diligence is more about how thoughtfully and consistently users learn. And one day we will have a voice-driven skill for our learners as well. Andrew, it will be Did you know there was whisper mode on Alexa? I didn't, I didn't really know that. So that is, uh, that is our instructor skill. Whoops. That is our instructor skill. And that will be live for this fall. I'll tell you some other exciting things here. I'm going to skip that video. Our launch partner for this is Arizona State University. We are super excited by this. Um, we've done a lot of work with ASU for about three years. We power over 20,000 students at the university. They're leaders in innovation. They love this stuff. They've done a lot of work with Alexa, doing some neat things in the dorm. And uh, they're going to be our launch partner for both Insights and for uh, faculty using Alexa. One of the reasons we're doing this is we've seen from our own data that more engaged faculty lead to better results, better outcomes for learners. And so we believe that by lowering the friction of getting access to that data, we can give instructors a much easier way to get access and, and improve the lives of their students. So you can, you know, Basically, pop open your favorite adult beverage and ask Alexa how your astronomy class is doing. And we're excited by that. You can find out more information at serago.com slash Alexa. One other thing, I'm very excited to let you know that the, our friends at AWS Alexa have offered to provide 100 units of Alexa to anyone who's going to participate in our original uh, initial launch. So if any of you are out there are faculty, you're interested in giving this a shot and working with us and looking at the data of how that goes, Amazon AWS is going to back us all up, give you the devices, we'll give you access to the platform, and we'll go see if we can improve some outcomes together. Anyway, thank you so much, and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. That was great. Thank you, Andrew. So again, I'm John Calhoun. I am a solutions architect here at AWS on our public sector partners team. And today I'm going to talk to you about some of the work we've done with the White House Historical Association, building a chatbot for them. To so do a little introduction, we're going to go over the architecture, get a little techie, um, and I'll hand it off to them to actually explain it to you themselves. So what we're here to talk about today is Q&A Bot. So Q&A Bot is this project that started a little over a year ago. 
Um, I was working with Bob Strahan from our ProServe department. And we're working to build a question and answer chatbot that was easy to use, easy to deploy. The idea being content developers shouldn't have to be tech people to build these chatbots. So we built Q&A bot, and it's actually an open source project. So everyone here today can go to our GitHub and see the code for it. We have a blog post on it as well to um, describe you know, how to deploy it. So anyone with just an AWS account and the ability to read this blog post can launch their own chatbot. So we talked about, um, you know at Amazon we are customer obsessed. We're always listening to our customers and trying to figure out what they need and working to provide that for them. So for Q&A bot, our first customer was the American Heart Association. They wanted a chatbot, so we worked, worked with them to figure out what they needed, um, and that was the first version of Q&A bot. This is where the blog post came from. This is where the GitHub project came from. And then after that, we, were, we started working with the White House Historical Association. They needed some additional features, additional capabilities, so we worked with them to actually build that out for them and contribute that back into the open source project. So this was our idea, a single room with many doors. The idea was to have all the content in one place, but to have a variety of ways to interact with it. So Q&A bot, at its core, it's our, um, our Lambda service interacting with Elasticsearch. So we store all the data and content in Elasticsearch, and then Lex and Alexa call a Lambda function that translates the user's utterance into a query and then re returns the results. So a number of really interesting possibilities are here. So at the top you can see various stakeholders, content designers can contribute the content in, through our designer UI. So it's a web page we host through the project. They can upload content, edit it, change it without any additional expertise. That gets updated into the system. And then through Alexa and Lex, there's this variety of channels they can use. So through Lex, you know, Kik, Facebook, Twilio, Slack, we have a Lex web UI that allows customers to host a chatbot on their website. And that's actually what the White House Historical Association is gonna show you all today. And then through Alexa, you can have chatbots that run on Kindles, Fire TVs, Echoes, Shows, Dots. And again, all these things can run off the same content. So there's one place content designers can put in their, their questions and what the answer should be, and it will get split across all these different services. So Andrew made a really good point or earlier about using chatbots to spread content over time. So for a typical web page, you're gonna have a ton of content spread throughout the page. A really interesting use case of chatbots is to help spread that content over time. So a user can ask the initial question, you know, what can I do? and then they would get an answer, and then from there they can navigate themselves through the content. That's one of the features we actually built out for the White House Historical Association, was to build out um, the ability to navigate. So not just questions and answers, but also navigation. The ability to ask follow-up questions, the ability to say next, and sort of read a story about information. It's great for situations where you want a chatbot, but you have multiple ways you want your users to consume it either through Lex or through Alexa. And then a really exciting thing is through our Amazon Connect service. So Amazon Connects allows you to build a call center on demand, and it integrates right into Lex, which allows you to integrate right into Q&A bot. So again, you can set up Q&A bot, you can get a phone number people can call into, and interact with your bot, and ask questions. So that's the basics of Q&A, but I'm gonna hand it off to Whitney and Joanna from the White House Historical Association. They're gonna talk more of the details about what they, what they did. Joanna from White House Historical Association. Uh, we are a private, nonpartisan, non-government associated uh, nonprofit with a mission to enhance the public understanding and appreciation of the executive mansion. 
Uh, and what that means for me and Whitney, for our team in the education department, is to help teachers use the stories of White House history as a lens for understanding the history of the United States. And the idea here is to help them understand that our tools and our resources can be used as a complement to the packed curriculum that they're already responsible for teaching. Uh, so as we've been expanding our digital resources and our online curriculum over the last couple of years, we've been able to serve teachers on a national scale, which has been a, a really important shift for us. Uh, and we're able to use those teachers as our ambassadors uh, as, through our, our White House History Teacher Institute. So this chatbot uh, that we're super excited about actually grew out of an initial project with uh, AWS and our digital library team. Uh, they were engaged in uh, a project to, to digitize the, the rich visual resources that we have in our collection of the, the 200 years of history uh, of the executive mansion. And, and that foundation has really allowed us to explore a number of different uh, digital products. Uh, so through that, we had this opportunity to explore this new chatbot uh, technology with the team at AWS. We originally thought that we would use this to uh, uh, offer a sort of a virtual tour of the White House, but since we've just launched uh, an actual mobile app that offers that same experience, if you have not downloaded that, please do it today, White House Experience, it's available on whatever uh, device you're using. Uh, we decided to blend that idea actually together uh, with one of our most popular curriculum units uh, on the roles of the president. This is also something that is part of the, the standards that are taught in history and civics courses nationwide. So that was, was the, the avenue that was really going to work for us uh, to, to make this new technology something that teachers would be able to use in their classrooms uh, as, as something that, that would, would suit their needs. Uh, so I think that as Whitney is going to take us through a demo, which is really the, the most exciting part to see while you're here, you'll be able to see that we were able to use this chatbot as a way to enhance a lot of the resources that we already have available, a way to highlight some of the stuff that we had already been doing rather than to replace those things uh, and to be able to really drive traffic to a lot of our other uh, available resources on our website. So Whitney, if you want to come on up and take this away? I think, do we need to? Yeah, we're good. OK. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Whitney. I am the um, Education Resources Manager at the White House Historical Association. And I was kind of the one who added all of our content and the knowledge that we knew into the AWS platform that they provided for us. And we really kind of workshopped with them to find these features that would really help out our content and really spread it nationwide. Um, so I'm actually going to switch over. Um, instead of showing you just this screen, I'm actually going to do a uh, demo with my laptop. Okay. Great. Um, so it actually right now lives live on our web page. You can go there at whitehousehistory.org slash education or Rubenstein Center, which is our education unit, and it is live there. If you see it, it will pop up immediately. You can minimize it if you want to check out the other resources that we have available. But what's great is, so we started with these uh, roles of the president. And I'm going to enter the bot now. Now, this actually can be voice or it can be text. I'm going to show you the text first. And then I'll um, actually have a quick video of the Alexa skill that we're working on to launch. Um, and what's great here is the welcome. It's kind of standard. Um, but what's great is we use Markdown in order to create these bolded words. Um, and we found that this was a great way to make intuitive responses so that if I type in next, previous, bold, help, or what does the president do, I can add all of those and this bot knows that. And so giving that kind of way of helping the user to find their way through this bot since this is kind of a new technology for a lot of students. So I want to find out what does the president do. Um, and so we have these eight roles of the president that we started with, again, all in bold. I should know that then I can uh, type those in and I can find out about any of those. Or to make it easy, we can do start roles. 
So here you can see that there's a little bit of a kind of description. Um, and then right here is actually a link to the image that is below. And as Joanna mentioned, um, our kind of collaboration with AWS started with the digital library. And that is such an important asset that we have that we really want to spread those images out to everyone. And so they're all included is you can have a link and it ends up going to our asset in our digital library. It's also on here. So it's on multiple platforms really enhancing the resources we already have. And uh, John mentioned that they ended up building out this navigation system for us. So next and previous are great ways to kind of do a central line to the information that we find is most essential to get to the students and to the teachers. So if I type in next, it's thinking. The next role is commander in chief. And so again, I see here that it's talking about the commander in chief. I have a link to the image. I see that image. But you know, what about this room? Tell me more. I don't know much about the situation room. So what's great is I don't even have to say the word situation room. Situation room and commander in chief are actually linked together through the bot. So it knows through this topic that that's the room I want to talk about. If I had done it with chief of state, I actually would have got to the east room. So it's been a great thing that they've kind of helped us and tied these things together so we're not constantly having, because there's a lot of rooms in the White House. And so if you just say room, it's helpful that it's tying these things together. Um, and another great thing uh, is that we are able to link out these classroom resource packets that we created in the last year. We don't want to just throw those away. So it links out and actually someone can explore, get more information. If it's something that they're interested in, they can move forward with that. And then from there, I have gone through all eight roles. And after that, I can actually take a quiz. This is a great assessment tool. It's also just something that's fun to take. We love to take BuzzFeed quizzes. Uh, so here's a quiz. It's testing my knowledge. It's multiple choice. Um, and this, it's a presidential role involving special dinners at the White House with foreign leaders. That sounds like a party to me. So I'm going to choose C. So that, in fact, was wrong. Uh, <laughs> That would be chief diplomat, actually. But what's great about this is they also built in the feature where we can provide feedback to someone who gets the, the incorrect answer or even the correct answer. So this is just a helpful reminder that, um, hey, you know, a foreign leader can also be called a diplomat. So chief diplomat and tying those things together. So it's a great way to kind of provide that um, feedback for teachers and students. Um, so that's kind of the basic functions. I really encourage you guys to kind of explore this more. Um, it has a lot of the great features that AWS um, kind of showed for us. And then I'm going to switch back to my PowerPoint now. Maybe. Oh, yeah, great. So switching back to the PowerPoint, I'm actually going to show you guys a quick little uh, demo that we recorded of on a Fire TV of using the same technology that was on the chatbot, easily converted into an Alexa skill. And Alexa, start history chatbot. Hello, please ask a question. What does the president do? Living and working in the White House, the President of the United States performs many roles. These include the following, Chief of State, Commander-in-Chief, Chief Diplomat, Chief Legislator, Chief Executive, Chief Citizen, Chief Administrator, and Chief of Party. Begin learning with Start Roles. Start Roles. As Chief of State, the President is the public face and figurehead of the United States. An example of this role is when the President hosts public events or speaks on important issues in the East Room. What is the East Room? The East Room is the largest room in the White House and can be adapted for many uses including musical performances, press conferences, and other special occasions. Okay, so that is kind of the Alexa skill that we're working on adapting to. Um, and some other features of both are kind of just general Q&A questions that we get all the time, um, like when was the White House built? 
1792. Um, also adding in vocabulary words. So for students and teachers, uh, maybe they don't know what the word veto is. A student sees that in one of the answers, but they don't know what that is. If they type that in, we're adding and we're teaching the bot more and more information. And that's what I think we're most excited about is that there's such an expansive, you can add so much content into this bot to teach it anything that you want a student, a teacher, the public to learn. And this lives live on our website. And so we're really excited about that. Now, in building the bot, these are some of the lessons that we learned. We actually tested this out with a few of the teachers, um, with actually a local uh, school that is in Springfield. And so during this, we kind of learned that the difference between linear and branching out of content. Um, it's not just this straightforward content where you're going to each date, each time. From there, we actually thought that we need to branch out. We need to, if they're interested in chief estate, they should get to explore that more. So add and ask more questions from that little branch. Our tree trunk are these eight roles, but then you're kind of moving forward and you're finding these branches for these different things that they might to it want to explore. Um, just having images, making it dynamic, and that really utilizes our, our digital library. Um, and then the incorporation of the quiz feature is just exciting, learning how to tweak that so that it's providing that feedback for students and for teachers. Um, and then we have the intuitiveness of commands. That's where I was talking about using the bolding with Markdown or using SSML with the voice so that you're really getting a dynamic experience and we're continually building that and working on that um, to make this more of a experience. And I'm going to hand it over to Joanna, who was a former teacher herself, to kind of talk more about how we can put this into action into a modern 21st century classroom. Okay. So, um, super excited about this chat box, <laughs> um, as I think you can see. Um, so, as a former classroom teacher, I would have loved to have had something like this uh, when I was in the classroom, and I'm, I'm really stoked to be able to share it with teachers now. Uh, so I think that what's great about this is that it, it is really versatile for a, a number of different types of educational settings. Obviously, it would be, uh, you could use it very easily in a traditional classroom. A teacher could use this for content delivery in the way that you probably imagine a traditional classroom working. But it would also be fantastic in a flipped classroom where a, a student is responsible for that in instructional delivery on their own time outside of the classroom because it is so individualized. Uh, and similar to that, a student could approach this information on their own and learn this completely independently. Um, I think that we've also been able to sort of structure this in a way that uh, it suits different learning styles and different types of learners. It, we were able to structure it in a way with the commands of, of Next and Previous so that it, it works for a learner who does want to follow directions. There are still learners who want to follow directions and they want to go straight through. Uh, but there are a lot of learners who really want to mess around and they want to jump straight through or they want to try to trip up the bot. You know, they want to try to see if they can trick it. Uh, in, in some different ways. Those learners are gonna have different experiences with this chatbot, but they're gonna get the same content. Um, I think that the other thing that is wonderful about this is that the primary sources are embedded within the content because the cards contain these images. We know that using primary sources is essential to effective instru instruction. Uh, within the history classroom, and so that's built right in. Teachers are not going to have to go and pull primary sources to use with this content. It's already part of the process. Uh, and of course, with the quiz, because it gives you the right answer, there's the opportunity to reteach that's built right in. Uh, all of these things are, are seamless. As I said in the beginning, we really want to be able to give teachers products that fit within what they're already doing. Uh, the, that meet their needs so that they're not having to work extra to use the stuff that we want to give them. Uh, so as we've been building this first trunk uh, with, with the roles, we have started to build some of these other branches, as Whitney mentioned, building this vocabulary branch, building the, the frequently asked questions branch. The feedback that we're getting from teachers and students is that that is exactly what they would like to see more of. Uh, so we know we're on the right track with that. They also would like to see more opportunities to make choices. Uh, they'd, they'd like to be able to, to have some more forks, some more uh, opportunities where they get to choose to go down this path or this path. So we're working on ways to be able to integrate that uh, as we continue to develop this. 
Uh, the, we're also getting the feedback that they would really like for this to be a more conversational experience. Uh, I think obviously that's something that we're all trying to consider as we're using AI in educational settings, just how to make that experience more human. Uh, so yeah, obviously I hope that you go and check this out uh, on our website. We love our chatbot. I think that you might actually learn something that you didn't even know you wanted to learn. Uh, but I hope that you also go away from this understanding how easy it was for us to use this Q&A bot technology. Um, it really is built in a way that anyone can access this technology and build something that is dynamic, interactive content delivery to reach 21st century audiences. So thank you. Do you want to do Q&A? Q&A. Okay. You can do Q&A. So I'm going to invite our I'm going to invite all our speakers to come back up here um, and do a little Q&A with y'all. Sort of old-fashioned Q&A. Yeah. Any questions? I've got a question. Uh, raise your hand, and I'll come find you with a microphone. Yeah. <laughs> there are 35 bathrooms in the White House. That is a frequently asked question. <laughs> Yeah. What about science and math? What about science and math? Yeah, what about science and math? So th that's a great question. I think that John could speak to this. Like the this is the sort of platform that could be used to create a bot to teach anything that you would be interested in, in doing. And I, I can imagine. So I, in a previous life, was a math teacher, and just the ability to students to go, what is algebra? How do I take the derivative of equations. Um, I think that'd be really powerful. Mm -hmm. And you can start seeing, ad adding the ability to e answer easy questions quickly is really powerful mm -hmm. to student, and also enable the teacher to focus on the more in-depth technical questions. Mm -hmm. I think it's a really enabling feature. What do you <laughs> can I, I don't want to get that close, John. I can see. <laughs> So um, I didn't do it, my team did it. So you're asking a question a little bit above my pay grade, but essentially what we did was we built our own model um, by uh, reading all of Wikipedia. So we ingested all of the articles. We were able to create a knowledge graph from that using word to vec and some other um, systems that we were able to customize. And then what the system can do is ingest unstructured text, create structured items in Serigo, and then allow someone to go through and edit and curate those items, and then we use a neural net to then inform the system about those changes. So, as for the uh, history bot and the ability that uh, was extended to include vocabulary, I was wondering how extensible it is, and is it easy to put in hooks or essentially allow for something that's not already included in, the, in its data set to trigger maybe a web search or maybe to hook into that ingestion of the Wikipedia and come back with other results? Um, I mean, right now we're kind of at just the beginning phase, I mean, of these roles. I mean, we really want it to eventually encompass what's on our website and be in that searchable way. Um, but that's something actually we're continually working with AWS. We're going to brainstorm on Monday of how we can further move this along and incorporate more of those kind of search terms and pulling from other places and stuff. Yeah, and maybe to add on that a little bit, I think the cool part about the platform is it allows the content you know, the content knowledge experts to iterate. So they can see the questions, see what's working, adjust the content, all on their own. So they don't need to yeah. get into programming or do all that. They can focus on what their expertise is. Um, and yeah. I was gonna say, I mean, with for us, for like a Wikipedia answer, that's not always the best way to tell something. Um, because it's maybe too lengthy or it's actually incorrect in some ways. So for us, right now, we've been controlling the content through the designer of really 
kind of tweaking and making sure that those answers are the best answers available. And for us, that's really important to provide the best knowledge of our content area that we're focusing on. So with the Sarago, is it kind of like the Google Classroom where like a teacher will make this thing and make their course and lessons and then get students into it? Is that how it is? Yeah, I'm not sure. Hello? Hi. Sorry. Um, so yeah, an instructor can make content. Um, there are some libraries of open source content that we have available on our platform for community colleges and for higher ed. Subjects like biology 101, anatomy and physiology, sociology, history and economics. And so all that content's available and faculty can kind of go through, find the content they want, remix it, and publish it to their students and then the learning algorithm takes over. I have questions on the chatbot. How do you take care of the unexpected questions? For example, uh, when you do a demo, um, you saw the picture and suddenly somebody asking for a room, something like that, which might not be on the system. How do you take care of those kind of situation that's not expected? Yeah, it's, it's a really interesting challenge. Um, you know, the you know, way a Q&A bot works is it's sending a query to Elasticsearch which you know, does really advance you know, word matching and stuff. But it doesn't really know whether the answer is right or not. It's really the consumer, the user of Q&A bot that knows whether something's about right. Um, so we actually added a feature um, to use Lambda hooks to extend questions, which then we built on top of that to build a feedback mechanism. So people could respond with and say, you know, that was a bad answer or that was a great answer. And we have a whole analytics on the back end using Kibana on top of Elasticsearch. That again lets the, the content owner see, oh, this is getting bad scores, or this is a question getting asked that we're not responding with good answers to. And then they can, on the fly, adjust the content. Mm -hmm. They don't have to go in and reprogram anything. They just adjust it right there. Uh, this may not be entirely relevant, but uh, could, this, could this technology be extended to teach things that require more creativity, like music or things like that? You know, I think so. And I think because, you know, we're talking about the ed education use case. It excels in these things where, you know, the answers are very clear and they're very common. So for music, you know, what are, what are the tuning of the strings on a guitar? Mm -hmm. You don't really need a guitar teacher to tell you the answer to that. So again, it, it allows a student to navigate all those easy things on their own and would free up the, the teacher, the educator, to step in on the more complicated things. So answer the questions of, where are the tuning? A chapter works great. But the question of, what should I play? And a, an instructor would be better for that. So you can sort of see as you know, we as you start thinking out all the broad applications of using chatbots. I'm sorry, I didn't. Do you, Yeah, and so his question is, you know, as, we, as you add more AI to it, it becomes more of a natural conversation. Mm -hmm. And that's really something, you know, we're, we're thinking about. You know, chatbots started as a basic question answer. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, with White House, we extended it to have quizzes, to have navigation. Um, and we have, so we're listening to customers to see what y'all want um, and try to provide that. So, you know, as customers ask for more natural conversations, um, we'd be happy to work with y'all to make that happen. Is there another question out there? Go one more oh. over here, maybe. Cerigo. <laughs> better. For Cerigo, uh, what grade levels have you deployed for? What grade levels are you targeting initially? That's a good question. So it's age agnostic. Um, the lowest grades that we've seen um, some early success were uh, in middle school. In fact, the largest study was in 4,000 middle school students in a charter school network in Florida. That's also a peer reviewed paper. So it goes from middle school kind of up. Anecdotally, um, my three-year-old, when my son was three, he was playing with Sarah to learn all the Disney cars. So you, depending on what the content is, you can go very young. But I think the sweet spot starts around middle school and up. 
Great. So I think we're coming to um, the end of our time. One last is there one, one last? One last one. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Serego, is that only uh, available in English or other languages are? Uh, the supported? content works in 176 languages in any direction. The interface has been localized into Arab. Arabic, Chinese, Japanese, um, what else? Do you know? French and something else. But you can localize. The whole thing is uh, skinnable in any language. And the content right now could be in any language. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thanks, for everyone, for coming. And again, I would invite everyone to check out you know, the White House Historicals website, Beho Chapa and Wa Sarago, see what I can do for you. And the mobile app. That's right. All sorts of cool stuff. <laughs> Thank you all.